So today I'd like to talk to you about maximum entropy, non-additive entropies, and biology. And this is a talk I gave over at the APS um, in Denver in, two, in March in 2014. Now I have a group at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI. And our group uses the tools of statistical physics to infer models from imaging and spectroscopy data. However, <clears throat> what I'd like to do during this short talk, which I hope will last about half an hour, is talk about theory, and I don't often get a chance to talk about pure theory, so I look forward to it today. Now I should say that the stuff I'll be talking about is quite at, is at a uh, quite high level, so if you want more details, I would like to immediately refer you back to our Reviews of Modern Physics and our PRL, both published in 2013. Now this talk will be broken up in three sections. First, I'll discuss the foundations of maximum entropy. I'll subsequently discuss uh, maximum entropy and dynamics. And finally, I'll discuss the logical implications of rejecting the principle of maximum entropy. And let me start off with a haunting quote from Gibbs, who well over 100 years ago now said that, although as a matter of history, Statistical mechanics owes its origins to investigations in thermodynamics. It seems eminently worthy of an independent development, both on account of the elegance and simplicity of its principles, and because it yields new results and places old truths in a new light in departments quite outside of thermodynamics. Now, there are a number of things in common between 19th century statistical mechanics and 21st century biophysics. To start off with, in the 19th century, uh, statistical mechanicians were concerned about distributions in phase space of gases, which were made up of a very large number of degrees of freedom. And from very limited macroscopic data, such as data on pressures, volume, or temperature, they wanted to infer entire distributions of phase space of those gases, made up of Avogadro's number of degrees of freedom. Now we have a very similar scenario in 21st century biophysics, where, for instance, we have FRET probes on two different regions of a protein, and we monitor fluctuations in the distance between those FRET probes from fluorescence measurements. And from this, we try to infer the incredibly complex structure, or the uh, fluctuations in dynamics, of the entire protein. So again, in both 19th century statistical mechanics and 21st century biophysics, we have very incomplete data and a very complex process giving rise to that very limited data. So we give up on deterministic models and we look for probabilistic descriptions of our systems. <clears throat> now, as is almost always the case, when we have very limited data and a very complicated underlying process, in both cases, we have a very large number of models that can fit the data. The question then becomes, well, how do we go about finding the best model given our very limited data? Well, Boltzmann had a solution to that. He said, of all possible models, pick the model which has the largest entropy. Or in other words, he said, maximize the entropy of the model. And this was, in a nutshell, the solution to Boltzmann's vastly underdetermined problem, <clears throat> which was, again, to infer distributions in, of phase space, so in other words, distributions of coordinates and velocities of gas, of, uh, gas particles. And whether by luck or by inspiration, he, Boltzmann, put into his equations only the dynamical information that happened to be relevant to the questions he was asking or so said Jaynes in 1979. In other words, in order to predict distributions of gas particles, Boltzmann used only average energies and particle numbers. Those macroscopic measurements, which using the maximum entropy procedure, uh, specified distributions in phase space of those gas particles. Now needless to say, Boltzmann was very heavily criticized uh, for this work. 
in particular because he ignored the explicit dynamics of the particles. So now fast forward to the late 40s, round two. When something is as fundamental as using the principle of maximum, of maximum entropy sorry, to select uh, the most probable model, there usually are a number of ways of justifying this principle. Now Shannon proposed a very different way for justifying the principle of maximum entropy. What Shannon di did was to say the following, we have limited data available to us from which we have to select one of many possible models which could be consistent uh, with that limited data. And by model in this case what we mean is a probability distribution for outcome i, so p sub i. And what Shannon said was, let's try to maximize the uncertainty of the model given the data and pick the model with the largest uncertainty. And Shannon proposed a series of axioms that any reasonable notion of uncertainty should satisfy. And on the basis of this, he arrived at the principle of maximum entropy. Now fast forward to the late 50s, and James repitches all of statistical mechanics in the language of maximizing uncertainty and from this principle inferring models of distributions of particles. So Jane said, suppose we only have an average energy available to us and we'd like to be able to infer an entire distribution of energy. Then he said, let's go ahead <clears throat> and maximize the uncertainty of the model given known constraints, in this case an average energy, from which pops out the Boltzmann distribution, or the distribution which maximizes this particular objective function. Well, needless to say, Shannon and Jaynes were also very heavily criticized for this procedure. <clears throat> and this is a quote from Uhlenbeck. And that, you know, this is Uhlenbeck from the Uhlenbeck-Ornstein process. So this, um, so this person is no dummy, but nonetheless he said, entropy cannot possibly be an amount a measure of amount of ignorance, because different people have different amounts of ignorance. Entropy is a definite physical quantity that can be measured in the laboratory with thermometers and calorimeters. Now this certainly is true, but Uhlenbeck was misinterpreting James's work. Nonetheless, following this criticism, um, yet another approach uh, was proposed to justify the maximum entropy principle. And as they say, the third time's a charm. Now come Shorn Johnson, fast forward to the early 80s. Shorn Johnson said, there exists a function, and this function has a maximum. And the maximum of this function coincides with the probability distribution, well, coincides with the optimal model. And the optimal model here, a model would be a probability distribution uh, for a series of outcomes, subscripted i. Now what Shorn Johnson said was the following, we would like to have one unique model, one unique optimal model, I should say. So therefore, whatever this function that we're trying to maximize is, um, it should have a unique maximum. Now furthermore, Shorn Johnson said, whatever predictions are made from this optimal model should be coordinate invariant. And this is very reasonable. In other words, if I give a model to a particular student <clears throat> and I ask them to make a prediction, it should not matter whether they choose to use spherical coordinates or elliptical coordinates to do their calculation. And finally, Shorn Johnson added that if the data does not couple outcomes, then the following must be satisfied. And that is subset independence. <clears throat> so, if pk star, so in other words, the probability for outcome k is increased by some amount, and the probability for outcome j is decreased by the same amount, then no other outcome probabilities should be affected. This is basically the equivalent of saying that if the data does not couple outcomes, then the model, or the optimal model, <clears throat> 
should not couple should not couple those models. In other words, it should not impose structure that is not warranted by the data itself. System independence. The predicted joint probability for two events must be the product of the predicted marginal probabilities. And again, this is true if the data does not couple outcomes. So in other words, the probability of rolling a 1 and a 2 should simply, on a, if you roll a dice, should simply be the probability of rolling a 1 and then rolling a 2. So it should be the product of those marginal probabilities. Unless we have reason to believe, through the data, that the probability of rolling a 1 and the probability of rolling a 2 are coupled. And if you agree to those four very basic axioms, then the function whose maximum agrees with these axioms is none other than the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, or alternatively, any function uh, with an identical maximum. Now, just to re-emphasize, here are, here are things that Shore and Johnson have not assumed. They have not assumed any notion of equilibrium, stationarity, ergodicity, any particular structural specificity of the model or the data itself, and they have certainly not assumed that all data should be treated on an equal footing. In other words, if some data comes with very large error bars, and some other data comes with very small error bars, then those should constrain the model uh, in proportion to the size of their... Uh, the, the model with larger uncertainty should constrain the model less than the data coming with very small uncertainties. And I should also add that Shorn Johnson have not assumed any notion of uncertainty, which earlier, if you remember, had been heavily criticized. So since the principle of maximum entropy is so general, then it should hold equally well for dynamical systems. So now let's consider a system that can evolve along multiple paths. And let's call this particular path, path C. And so P of C is the probability of observing path C. Now consider another path the system can take. <coughs> C prime, and the probability for that particular path is P of C prime. Now, if we have no reason to believe uh, from the data that path C and path C prime are in any way coupled, then the probability of observing path C and C prime should be the probability of observing path C times the probability of observing C prime. And if we want a model with those types of properties, then, as an illustration just before, we would, we would want to maximize um, the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy in order to find the best probability distribution for our paths. And I should add that for historical reasons, Jaynes called the uh, path entropy maximum uh, the, the notion of maximizing a path entropy, um, maximum caliber, for reasons which um, you can look up in our reviews of modern physics if you're interested. So, how is this useful? Well, there's a whole series of imaging and spectroscopy methods that naturally lend themselves to a path type formulation um, or a trajectory. For instance, FCS, which uh, yields fluorescence intensities, or FCS FRED, or FRED, or PALM, patch clamp, force spectroscopy, and so forth. So here's an example of a, well, a cartoon of a patch clamp trajectory. And here you're monitoring an ion channel undergoing transitions between an open and a closed state. Now, a perfectly reasonable question is to ask, what is the probability of observing a particular path, C, where I0, in this case, is the state of the channel at time 0, I1 is the state of the channel at time 1, I2 is the state of the channel at time 2, and so forth. And it would be particularly interesting to answer this question if that particular trajectory is not even observed. 
So in other words, this would be equivalent to asking the question, what is the probability that it rained tomorrow, given that, of course, tomorrow is not a repeatable experiment? So now in order to find the probability for those paths, we follow a recipe which is identical to the recipe uh, for finding the probability distribution of energy using kind of the textbook example of maximum entropy. So we start off either with the principle of maximum entropy or the principle of maximum caliber. We constrain uh, this function given measurable observables. So in the case of energy for um, <clears throat> In the case of maximum entropy applied to statistical mechanics, we may have, for, uh, for, for example, an average energy, while in the case of maximum caliber, we may monitor, for instance, the number of time steps that we spend in state m, which is n sub m, or the number of times we transition between state n and m, which is n sub n go to m. And if we constrain those using Lagrange multipliers and maximize uh, the appropriate entropy, on the one hand we obtain the Boltzmann factor, <clears throat> and on the other hand we obtain a distribution of trajectory which looks very similar to the Boltzmann factor. And not only that, uh, but keep in mind that in doing this there are no adjustable parameters. In other words, all Lagrange multipliers are determined by those quantities um, which are directly observable in experiments. So what are some of the consequences of this principle of maximum caliber? Well, first of all, Markov processes can now be looked at um, as following from the data from first principles if they are warranted by the data. Uh, they need not be imposed by hand. In other words, if we measure uh, the number of transitions between state, states and try to use the principle of maximum caliber to infer a probability distribution of trajectories, then we'll find that those trajectories natu uh, naturally break up um, in the way here shown on the right uh, with the products. And that's a hallmark of a Markov process. Furthermore, master equations need not be inferred, uh, need not be imposed by hand. Rather, they can be inferred from first principles if they are warranted by the data. So once again, the principle of maximum caliber supplemented by available data will give you a joint probability distribution, so that P that you see on the left-hand side. And now <coughs> we can integrate out um, a series of variables and marginalize our joint probability distribution, compute conditionals, and verify whether the expression on the right-hand side holds or not. If it does, then great. Our system satisfies a master equation. And if it doesn't, um, that's fine too. What it means is that the master equation was not warranted uh, given the data. Now there's a subtle point here. Um, which I would like to mention, but I won't go into any detail, and you can look for the details in our reviews of modern physics or a uh, JCP that we have in 2012. And the idea here is that the transition probability in the master equation is time independent. So usually when you write out a master equation for a process, you assume that the transition probability itself is time independent. However, in general, using the principle of maximum caliber, and constraining that principle uh, with respect to or constraining that function with respect to available data, you find that your conditional probabilities do depend on time. Now the question is, under what circumstance will the time dependence of those transition probabilities drop out? And only given certain data, therefore, is the master equation rigorously justified. In other words, only given certain data is it um, proper to assume that the transition probabilities are time independent, therefore justifying the master equation formulation. So what are some of the applications of the principle of maximum caliber? <clears throat> well, first, 
we can use it to infer rare switching events in feedback networks. So consider here a genetic toggle switch. What we have are two different protein populations, a red population and a green population, and they're competing against one another. Now suppose that we have a large number of red, uh, you know, red proteins, and they fluctuate in number over time. Every so often, their number will fluctuate by a large amount, and eventually the green will overtake the red, and you'll have a stochastic switch between the high red state and the high green state. But these switches happen very rarely. So now the question is, can we monitor fluctuations on, of red, for instance, over very short time scales in order, in order to infer um, the approximate frequency or the distribution at which um, the population will globally switch between a state of high red and high green? And the answer is yes, we can do this using the principle of maximum caliber. And details are given in our JFIS Chem B. Here's another interesting question. You can have a colloid hopping between two potential wells, and you can use the principle of maximum caliber to infer fluctuations of dwell times in particular states. And yet here's another application where you look at colloids which are constrained in a microfluidic device to one region, and they're suddenly allowed to freely diffuse. The principle of maximum caliber can then be used to predict the number of, or the probability of observing particular backward fluxes, or in other words, the probability of observing one colloid move up the concentration gradient rather than down the concentration gradient. So now if the principle of maximum caliber is so powerful and so successful, and I should say the principle of maximum entropy more generally is so successful, then why do people use other entropies? For example, this particular entropy here, called the Salus entropy. Here Q is a real number. And why do we care about this? Well, since 1988, our community has wavered on which entropy to use and when to use it. And furthermore, there have been thousands of papers written um, using the Salus entropy in selecting an optimal model, rather than using the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy to select a particular model. And we'd like to know what are the logical implications of not using the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy in selecting the best model. So here are some reasons why people like the Salus entropy. In the limit that Q goes to 1, the Salus entropy reduces to the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy. So therefore the Salus entropy is considered a generalization of Boltzmann-Gibbs. Furthermore, if you take the Salus entropy and constrain it with respect to an average on some quantity k, then the Salus entropy will naturally lead to power laws. And we know that physicists often find apparent power laws, uh, power laws in their data and would like to find a way to justify them. So one way to justify them could be to change the form for the entropy. <clears throat> so now, let's check the implications of violating the Shore and Johnson axioms. Now remember, if we use the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, what we are saying is, if the data does not couple event i and j, then the joint probability p of observing pi and pj is simply the product of pi and pj. <clears throat> now the question we ask is as follows. If we use the Salus entropy and we assume that events or outcomes i and j are not coupled from the data, then what are we assuming about the joint probability of event i and event j in our model? So in other words, what is the form for this function here? Is it simply the product of pi times pj if we have no coupling in the data? The answer is no. Here is the form that's assumed for the joint probability of event i and j if there is no coupling in the data, but if one chooses to use the Salus entropy in selecting a model. <clears throat> 
n here is just a normalization constant. Now I think it's worth stopping here and looking at this expression. What this tells us is, again, given no coupling between event i and j, here's what one assumes a priori when using the Salis entropy. And of course in the limit that q goes to 1, then we simply obtain pi times pj. So what's the reasoning behind using this entropy? Well, <clears throat> Salas said in 2011, although there are many similar justifications, the non-additive entropy, S sub q, in other words, uh, the Salas entropy, has been introduced in 1988, focusing on a generalization of the Boltzmann-Gibbs statistical mechanics. The aim was to cover a possibly wide class of systems, systems sorry, among those very many which violate hypotheses such as ergodicity, under which the Boltzmann-Gibbs theory is expected to be valid. And here again, we just want to emphasize what we believe is a flaw in the reasoning, which is to assume that somehow Boltzmann-Gibbs only applies for ergodic systems. Shore and Johnson tell us a very different story. They tell us Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy is the only entropy that will guarantee that our model satisfies basic self-consistency axioms. And, it, and the principle of maximum entropy, therefore, which yields the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, indeed has very little to do with either ergodicity, equilibrium, or stationarity. If you remember nothing else from this talk, please do remember, at least, that the principle of maximum entropy is very, very general, and it is not tied in any way, shape, or form to equilibrium. And furthermore, let me make a, wrong, uh, a strong statement and say it is wrong, or at the very least, extremely peculiar to use entropies, such as the Salas entropy, to infer models, because the logical consequences could be very surprising. Okay, so as I said, this talk was at a very high level. If you want to see details please go look at our reviews of modern physics, which discusses almost everything except for our discussion on Salus entropy, which is in our PRL, which was featured on Science Daily, amongst other places. Now, if you want to see some details on how we infer the master equation uh, given data, then please look at our JCP in 2012. That's the second small reference at the bottom. Um, if you want to see how the principle of maximum caliber can be used to justify Markov processes if warranted by the data, then see our JCP again, 2012. And finally, if you're interested in the issue of system bath coupling and how the principle of maximum entropy um, can be applied to both open systems and closed systems, uh, then see our PRE in 2012. And with that said, I'd like to thank um, well, <laughs> there are no organizers here because this was given at the APS, like I said, in 2014. I would like to thank Julian Lee, our collaborator over in Korea. Um, Konstantinos Tsekugas is my postdoc and he's doing excellent work, so I'd like you to keep an eye open on his work, um, which I think will be very exciting once it comes out. And King Shugosh and Ken Dill for all their, all their support and, um, and their amazing contribution to all of this. And finally, all of you listening to this YouTube video um, and IUPUI, my institution, and Burroughs Welcome Fund. Thanks.